And finally, the local labor force was often unreliable. Right? The tractor drivers often damaged the tractors, or what they would do is they would park them in these depressions in the land right, and leave the motors running. Because it turned out they, the monitors were placed on the motors, on the engines of the motors to record the work done. Right? So they would park them in these depressions. They found they could do that and leave the motors running. And then they could run off to the local cantina right, for their entire work shift. Okay? So, so what were the results of this project? Well, there were less than 10,000 acres were finally cleared and rooted. Right? They found another 20,000 acres that they could plant in and dried like that, right? Because they didn't have to clear anything or root anything, which is nice. Um, and they were able to get 11,700 acres cleared, but not necessarily properly rooted and leveled. Right? And now the project was, what, 150,000 acres? Right? So, well short of that. They were finally able to cultivate 2,000 tons of peanuts. Unfortunately, in order to get the project started, they had to be supplied with 4,000 tons of peanuts a seed. Probably not a real good measure of success there. No food products or peanut oil was ever delivered to, deliver to Britain, not a drop of peanut oil. Okay, Britain financed all this okay? at the tune of 49 million pounds before the project was completed in 1951. Right? They finally canceled it. They finally learned it. Actually, finally punished. Right? Okay, 49 million pounds. That's a pretty good chunk of change. 1951. What is that? 60 years ago. Right? That's a lot of money for very few peanuts. <laughs> Peanuts per pound is pretty awful there, right? Turns out the land was impacted, that they used was impacted, and now is as a dust bowl. Except I understand that if you walk through the land, occasionally you'll find a tractor in a depression. Because <laughs> <laughs> the guys who got so drunk at the canteen oftentimes couldn't remember where they parked the tractor. Right? So, good intentions, right? They were trying to help this country, right? Visible results. Why? Well, there's some thoughts. Some people said staffing, but that seems to be not the case. The evidence was that the operation may actually have been overstaffed. Right? Well, they spent 49 billion pounds. You probably guess it's the overstaffed. Right? Um, management attention. Uh, management was constantly, or essentially, people who were in charge of the project were constantly visiting, visiting the sites, and to some extent, they said that might have detracted from it because people spent time going to get people, get these managers at the airport, take them to and back instead of overseeing the project, you know, seeing those, seeing their workers in the cantina. Um, not the work ethic of, ethic of most local tractor op operators accepted, you know, many people did work really hard on this project, long days, long hours on the operation. Um, however, planning was not real great, right, obviously. Right? This type of project required military type of planning, and of course that one didn't happen. God, didn't happen. And they had to realize that hard work is not necessarily effective work. So in Britain today, you know, if somebody says, man, situations like a ground net scheme, right? You know what they mean. It's like in America when we say that's a snafu. Right? Everybody knows what staff food stands for, right? Same thing in Britain, ground nut scheme. You'll actually see it in some pop culture type of uh, references. Okay, so that's my historical side. Good intentions can sometimes go awry. Um, so let's talk about some quality tools, right? Automated SPC. SPC, right? Statistical process control. One of the oldest, most revered practices in quality. The beauty of it is it's really simple. Okay? It's just plot some data, plot some horizontal lines where the data should be. Right? Hopefully it looks like this. Right? Your data is all between the lines, right? Good thing. It's a nice, nice control chart. I'll be pretty happy with that one, right? Okay, so it's that easy, right? It's so simple. Let's automate it, right? This should be easy to automate, right? 
and then we can run it for every result we actually obtain in the operation. Okay. Systems people look at this and they respond like, all right, I can get data, right? I can acquire the data and I can probably plot it. That's relatively straightforward. How am I going to place those lines though? Okay. Well, only people come back and say, well, that's easy. There's a formula that we can use, right? There's formulas that we can use. Well, actually, there are numerous formulas, okay? And most of them, but most of them can cause issues in applications in actual manufacturing operations. Why? Well, most assume a statistical model having no between group or among group variation. Zero, okay? Present in the process. About the process that you run into, I've found it. The whole idea behind this rational subgroups, right? This rational subgroups, you see it in the quality literature everywhere, is that you pick your groupings such that this model is valid. Right? That's what a rational subgroup is. Pick a subgroup so that your variation between groups is zero or virtually zero. Not always easy to do. Right? There are some businesses where the way they're structured, that just isn't going to work. Right? You're just not going to be able to do that. I worked in semiconductors for a long time, and that's clearly one of them. And in the semiconductor industry, you can have a perfectly well-controlled process where 80% of your variation is from group to group. Okay? However, if you use the formulas that are expounded or essentially published in most SBC literature, the, the formulas only work off within group variation, right? You calculate, you look, you get your groups and you calculate a bunch of standard deviations for the groups or ranges for the groups, right? And calculate an estimate of standard deviation using specific constants, you know, things like that. And essentially what you're using when you do that is you're just using within group variation, right? To establish it, you're ignoring any between group variation. Right? Set up the limits, you're going to run into situations like this, potentially, when your process really is in control. Right? Most people figure this one out and realize that the estimate they need to use to set their limits is going to have to be based on an average, the, the variation of the averages of results, which is exactly what they're plotting here, okay? the group averages. If you do that, then the limits look like that. And that charts well with the control. Okay. So most people figure that one out. Now, many organizations that I've worked with in the past um, still find that the number of signals they're getting to be beyond their resources to adequately respond. Okay. And when they do respond, a lot of times they're thinking, man, I just can't find that assignable cause. What's driving that chart to signal? Okay lead to some frustration. Okay. Well, recall that when control charts were developed, right, Walter Shiart back in the 1920s at Bell Labs, right, classic, um, they were widely used by Deming in Japan post-World War II. Well, computing power wasn't really what it is today, right? So how they do their charts? They did them by hand, right? You can have computers at every manufacturing station. They had were paper charts. Okay. Today, with computerization, there are a lot of operations with thousands of charts running each day. 50,000 to a million per day is not unusual. Okay. It's not unusual in some industries. Well, recall, common recommendation is set these control limits at plus or minus three sigma, right? Standard deviations, right? Assuming you got your estimate of sigma right. Okay. Uh, you know, when only a few charts are being managed, which if you're doing it by hand, you're not doing a million, okay? You're probably doing one, two, three key properties, right, at a step, or maybe for the entire operation, for that matter, right? That kind of makes sense because we can calculate the probability of a false signal relatively easily, right? 